I'm Michelle the Irritable Vegan and I'm here to share your vegan and low FODMAP journey and hopefully take some of the BS out of IBS. Now today I'm so excited for this video because we've got some breaking news about a super simple version of the low FODMAP diet that Monash University have spoken about recently. If you're the kind of person who's avoided the diet or given it up completely because you found it too restrictive or too complicated, then I promise you, you're going to want to watch till the end of this video to hear all about the simplified approach. I really think this is going to be a huge game changer for a lot of people and I'm really excited to share my thoughts about it with you. Let's get into it. So all of this became public last week on the 24th of February when Alana Scott from A Little Bit Yummy conducted a Facebook Live interview with Dr Emma Halmus, a research dietitian from Monash University. Now for those of you that are not familiar, Monash University are the developers of the low FODMAP diet as we recognise it today, so they're the world's leading authority on all things low FODMAP. Following the interview, a short blog post was put up on the Monash FODMAP blog introducing a simplified version of the low FODMAP diet to the public and of course I'm going to leave links for all of that information in the description box below. So what is the simplified approach to the low FODMAP diet? Well basically it just means that you're focusing on removing only a small number of the highest FODMAP foods rather than restricting every single high FODMAP food from the diet and this means that it largely does away with the need to be constantly checking food lists with all of the accurate weighing and measuring to get the grams perfect and also a lot of the obsessing that can come with worrying about the FODMAP types and FODMAP stacking, all of which can be big barriers to people following the standard low FODMAP diet. So what foods are restricted? Well, if you're already at all familiar with a low FODMAP diet and the types of foods that tend to cause the most gut issues, then they'll be as expected. But Monash have released a list of 15 basic things that need to be restricted. These include grain-based foods made from wheat and rye, such as pasta, bread and pastries, five vegetables, which are onion, garlic, leek, cauliflower and mushrooms, five types of fruit, which are apple, pear, stone fruit, dried fruit and watermelon. Now obviously in the stone fruit and dried fruit categories there are lots of things in there such as dates, raisins, goji berries, peaches, plums and cherries but just to understand that everything in that category of stone fruit and dried fruit is excluded. There are two dairy exclusions which include milk and yogurt which obviously don't apply to vegans but the last one very much does affect us and that's a blanket restriction on all legumes and we'll definitely be talking about that later on in the video. So who is a simplified approach aimed at? Well firstly anybody that's previously avoided the diet because of its restrictive nature or anybody that's found the standard low FODMAP diet too difficult to follow. But it really comes into its own for groups of people that are currently told that a standard low FODMAP diet is not suitable for them. Now this includes people who are malnourished or at increased risk of becoming malnourished because they're underweight or suffer with malabsorption issues. For people that have other really complex dietary needs, such as people suffering with multiple food allergies, and although it's in no way an impairment, you could also suggest here that that may apply to people on a strict vegan diet. It's also a much more gentle approach for children and the elderly, and for anybody that's suffering with a disease or a condition where a big change in diet could possibly have a negative impact. And the example that they give for this is during pregnancy. So in practice, dietitians have been recommending versions of this simplified diet to their clients based on their own individual needs for quite some time. But it's only now that this has been really released out into the public. But what does this mean for the rest of us? Well, I thought it might be really helpful to look at some of the similarities and differences between the simplified approach and the standard low FODMAP diet. So we'll begin by looking at those things which pretty much stay the same. So the most important factor that remains unchanged is that you're still required to go to your doctor and investigate the causes of your gut issues before you start randomly removing foods from your diet. Now this, as always, has been in your best interest to make sure that you're fully informed and to just double check that there's no serious underlying medical conditions that could be causing your symptoms. The second thing to remain unchanged is that you're still recommended to do the simplified version of the diet under the guidance of a registered dietitian, preferably one that's FODMAP trained. 
Thirdly, the timescale for the diet remains the same, with the current recommendation being between two to six weeks to assess whether you're even sensitive to FODMAPs and to see some symptom relief. And this also means that once you finish your elimination phase, you are expected to progress onto the reintroduction phase and tackle those challenges just as you were before. And finally, and probably most obviously, the very high FODMAP foods remain the same. So you're still going to be expected to eliminate things like wheat, onion and garlic from your diet for the full elimination period, exactly the same way that you were in the standard version of the diet. So if any of these points were the major factors for you not completing or beginning a low FODMAP diet, then this simplified version probably isn't any better for you. So those are all the things that remain the same. But what's new, Pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, to begin with, if you fall into any of the previous categories that we've mentioned, so you're under 18, you're pregnant, you've previously been told by a dietitian that the low FODMAP diet may not be suitable for you, then it might be worth revisiting the idea with your health professional and seeing whether the new simplified version of the diet might be more beneficial for you. And obviously the list of foods to avoid is much shorter than in the standard version of the diet, so hopefully that'll help to make it more accessible, easier to follow and more achievable for more people. And I'd also argue that unlike the standard version of the diet, it does seem possible to do the simplified version without the use of the Monash app. And that's because it's a blanket ban on the highest FODMAP foods, which means that you don't really need to be accessing extensive food lists, portion sizes, traffic light systems and all the bells and whistles that are so helpful when you're doing the standard version of the diet. Although Monash themselves still recommend the use of the app, I honestly think the reasons behind this are a little bit self-serving. Now you know me, I'm a huge fan of the Monash FODMAP app. I wouldn't have been able to complete my own low FODMAP diet had it not been for the app, but I just think that some of the reasons and recommendations that they suggest for using the app in the simplified version are a little bit thin. And if you go and read the blog post, you'll understand what I mean. And the simple version is exactly that because it includes a short, simple list of foods to avoid in comparison to everything that's listed in the app. Now, if you then expected to take that very simple list and cross-reference it with the Monash app to find out more high FODMAP foods or to look for low FODMAP swaps for your high FODMAP alternatives, it's really no different than doing the standard diet. Because once you get into that app, you're going to get really bogged down in all the details and the tiny nuances of information that are so, so helpful when you're actually doing the standard version of the diet. If this simplified version of the diet really is enough to assess your sensitivity to FODMAPs and to experience some symptom relief, then surely all you really need to do is swap the high FODMAP foods on the simplified list for things which are not on the list, and it should work in theory. And I really agree with the need to clarify the fact that when you are making these swaps, you need to be doing like for like. So you swap out a vegetable and swap in a vegetable. You swap a high FODMAP fruit for a low FODMAP fruit. But unless you don't know the difference between a fruit and a vegetable or which foods fall into those categories, I don't think that cross-referencing to the Monash app is going to tell you anything that you don't already know. So to help you decide if the simplified version of the low FODMAP diet might be right for you, let's take a look at what I consider to be some of the pros and cons of this approach to the diet. We'll start with the pros, the main one being that when you simplify anything you make it more accessible to more people. As somebody that's personally experienced the benefits of a low FODMAP diet, the idea that potentially more people can help to manage their condition and control their symptoms by using a simpler approach is a huge win-win in my opinion. It may also encourage people that have previously dismissed the diet because it's too time consuming, too restrictive and too complicated to finally give it a go. Also in cases where people have previously attempted the diet and found it unmanageable, a simpler approach could give them the confidence to try again. It makes cooking and eating a low FODMAP diet simpler because there are less ingredients to restrict. Less restriction means less adaptation to your current favourite recipes and this is especially useful for maybe less experienced cooks, for people who have limited time or energy to put into cooking or for people who are cooking for a family. And a knock-on effect of less restriction ultimately means that you can focus on getting variety and balance into your diet without getting bogged down by all those nitty gritty details. And as we're all aware, variety and balance is key to giving your body exactly what it needs 
and it could potentially help to reduce the impact on your microbiome which is a very real concern for many people following the standard version of the diet. And I'm also a really big believer in the less restrictions we have around food, the better, not only for our mental health, but also for our stress levels and overall well-being. And speaking of rules, my biggest hope is that the introduction of this simplified version just helps everybody to generally relax a lot more when it comes to the standard low FODMAP diet. All too often I'm seeing people tying themselves up in knots, freaking out about FODMAP stacking, scrutinising every single tiny thing that they've eaten and putting impossible strict controls onto the diet such as only eating one FODMAP type per meal or literally timing themselves in between meals to make sure that they do everything right. Now hopefully if the simplified version shows us anything it's that we really don't have to drive ourselves crazy to actually see some relief and improvement in symptoms. And finally the result of less restriction, simpler swaps and a more natural approach to eating can only do good things to our general stress and anxiety levels which as we all know can wreak absolute havoc on our guts regardless of what and how we're eating. Well that all sounds fantastic but what are some of the possible cons to a simplified approach? Well firstly it's really important to address the fact that unlike the standard low FODMAP diet the simplified version hasn't really undergone any testing to determine exactly how effective it is in comparison to the standard version of the diet. This simplified approach is based on the invaluable experience of the research dietitians who are the ones that are expected to implement this across huge groups of people all with highly individualised needs. So Dr Halmus, the research dietitian that introduced this simplified version of the diet to us, has published a research paper which identified the complexities of applying the standard low FODMAP diet in real life and the need to introduce a simplified version. It's a really interesting reading so I will leave the link to that in the description box below. But it does suggest that not only is more research needed generally in the area of low FODMAP diets but also that the simplified approach to the diet really does need to be identified through a professional dietitian and applied specifically to the people that have a direct need for it. On a more practical note, as I mentioned earlier, many aspects of the diet remain the same. So if any of these aspects were the reasons why you avoided or quit the diet in the first place, then the simplified version of the diet is really going to be no use to you. If you're hoping to avoid having that awkward chat with your doctor, if you don't have access to a dietitian, if you're not prepared to make the commitment to the two to six week elimination phase, if you know you're going to be stressed out and anxious actually reintroducing the foods back into your diet, or if you just don't want to learn how to cook without onions and garlic, then this version of the diet is really no simpler for you. And unfortunately, many of these things are imposed upon the diet for your own benefit, for your health, and for the efficacy of the diet. So it's unlikely that any of these things are gonna change in the future. Another big con is that the simplified approach to the diet seems to only really affect the elimination phase. So you're still gonna to need to make that huge commitment to systematically work through the elimination phase and the reintroduction phase to really take control of your diet and identify your tolerances and your triggers. And for many people, the challenge or reintroduction phase is actually much harder than the elimination phase. And if that applies to you, then there doesn't really seem to be any difference between the standard and the simplified versions of the diet. And speaking of being in charge of your diet, this unfortunately means that when eating out, when reading labels, or whenever you're not in control of the cooking, you're still gonna to need to be avoiding those highest FODMAP foods. Things such as wheat, onion, garlic, and dairy that feel like they're in every single food item. It's very unlikely that if you ever went out to eat, even on the standard version of the diet, you would not have presented the chef with a huge list of every single thing listed in the Monash app and every single portion size you could tolerate. The chances are that you reduced it down to a simplified version, exactly like the list that's available in the simplified version of the diet. So this means when it comes to eating out and socialising, when it comes to relying on packaged or processed foods, there really is no difference between the standard version of the diet and the simplified version. You're still as restricted and limited as you were before. So one of the biggest downsides I can see of making the diet more simpler is that many more people are likely to tackle it alone, possibly without the knowledge or the consent of their doctor, 
definitely without the guidance of a dietitian and without having any real knowledge of how to apply the diet to their own specific health and dietary needs. These types of people are much more likely to rely on googling their way through the diet which leads them more at risk of receiving inaccurate, out of date and maybe even just downright dangerous answers to the questions that are undoubtedly going to come up. And speaking of questions, I know all too well that when anybody's followed this diet for any length of time, they come up with the most detailed, specific questions that are unique to their very own individual circumstances. Now, the fact that these people have decided to follow a simpler version of the diet won't necessarily make these questions any simpler, but it does mean, as we've already discussed, that they're much more likely to be open to receiving answers from unreliable sources. And when these people do decide to start going into Facebook groups or online to seek answers to the questions that are undoubtedly going to come up, then the, the types of answers that they get are going to leave them open to a lot of confusion and a lot of contradiction because most people answering those questions are going to automatically assume that they're doing the standard version of the low FODMAP diet, that they have access to the Monash app, that they understand portion sizes and FODMAP types and all of the other details that come with following the standard diet. So this may then unwittingly steer the people who started off with the simpler version of the diet into the standard diet and they'll find themselves there without any kind of professional advice or without a dietitian to turn to. And last but by no means least, especially for my vegan friends out there, is the restriction on all legumes. Now in many ways this is going to make the simplistic version of the diet actually harder to follow for anybody like vegans, vegetarians, plant-based, anyone who relies on legumes as an integral staple part of their diet. Now obviously if you're doing this as intended, under the guidance of a dietitian, they're going to be able to work with you one-on-one -on -one to make sure that that is only as restricted as it needs to be and to come up with a plan to suit you. But as we've already mentioned, the likelihood is that there are going to be many people who are tackling this alone and to cut all those legumes out of their diet is going to leave some really big nutritional gaps. And I'm not suggesting here that it's impossible to be vegan unless you can eat legumes. I know many people that do it, but it's really not something that I would like to think that I was tackling without having a professional dietitian on board. Now, currently, when you're following the standard diet, wherever possible, Monash lists low FODMAP safe servings of high FODMAP foods, even when those safe servings are really very small. And this is a feature of the Monash app that many vegans take advantage of, because that means that we can include very small quantities of legumes throughout the day into our diet to help boost our protein and nutritional intake. Now, whilst a blanket restriction of legumes is much easier to understand and for the majority of people much easier to implement, for those of us that rely on legumes as part of our day-to-day -day diet, it really does pose a huge barrier. And there's already the need for much more vegan-friendly, low FODMAP information coming from the professionals and from research sources. So this does feel like a huge step back in making the low FODMAP diet not only simpler for everybody, but also much more inclusive. So there you have it. What do you think of the simplified low FODMAP diet? Is this breaking news or is it something that you're already familiar with? And is it something you'd be likely to attempt? For those of you that have already completed your low FODMAP diet, do you wish that you'd been offered this as an alternative route to get to where you are today? I'd love to chat with you about it in the comments below and if you've enjoyed this video please make sure you leave me a thumbs up. It really does help the channel and it also helps me to decide what type of content to include in the future. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll speak to you soon. Bye! What's new pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs>